This is the first of a couple of videos about the X7 generation of the Citroen C5. In this instalment, we're covering the history, so let's get cracking. Part one, history. This generation of Citroen C5, which is the second or third generation, depending on how you count it, never saw much love, not even among Citroen fans, mostly because of this. Made in France. And as for those who are not Citroen fans, they simply didn't care because, well, it's a Citroen. And most people are bad snobs and don't like Citroens. And maybe also because around the time it was launched, a little hiccup with the world's finances occurred. You may have heard of it. This is going to be one of the watershed days in financial markets history. The International Monetary Fund warns we're facing a major economic downturn. So people had a lot more to think about than some recently launched French car. At the time of its launch, I don't remember seeing that many reviews of this C5. And unfortunately, those that were posted managed to miss the mark in various ways. For example, honestjohn.co.uk called it terminally uninteresting, dynamically soggy, patchy interior quality, confusing dashboard, no hatchback option. The only part I agree with there is that there's no hatchback option. And that's just simply a massive injustice, because not only is it a better car than people think, but it surpasses a lot of the rubbish many bad not pass off as the supposed benchmarks for this type of car. So that's why I've decided to make this, not only to correct that injustice, but also because when I had the idea, the world was going through the great coronavirus lockdown of 2020, and I had nothing better to do. So let's delve into the history behind this car. And for that, we'll have to go back in time, all the way back to the beginning of the 21st century, to September of the year 2000 at the Paris Motor Show, where the original C5 was first shown. It's the first Citroën to sport the brand's new naming convention for its core passenger models, a C followed by a number, a naming format still used by Citroën to name its models to this day. Up until the C5 and throughout the 90s, Citroën had given its cars awkward names with X's, namely the Xantia, the Saxo and the Xara, which no one knows how to pronounce correctly. Xara, Xara, whatever, let's move on. The C5 became available to buy in March 2001, and straight away it was a bit polarizing in the looks department, to put it nicely. In 2004, it underwent a profound facelift, with Citroën saying it was to bring the C5 in line with its new corporate image, as exemplified by the then recently launched C4. However, it was the only Citroën change to look like the C4, since the C2 and C3 did not have their looks tweaked to look like the aforementioned C4. It just went to show how Citroën acknowledged how aesthetically unpleasing people thought the first gen C5 was. But this facelift made the car look so sharply dissimilar to the pre-facelift version that in certain markets, people refer to it as the C5 Mark II, while in others, such as in its native France, it's known as the C5 Mark I Phase II, a post-facelift model. From what I could glean from very sparse information, the program that gave rise to the next-gen C5, dubbed Project X7, began around the time the first Gen C5's facelift was unveiled. This first proposal from March 2004 looks simply like an enlarged C4 of the time with a revised front end, while the estate version has a rear profile that seems to evoke the original C5 estate. In August 2005, a model that was remarkably similar to the future C5 was proposed as was an estate version that bears more than a passing resemblance to what would become the C5 Tourer. The interior that made it into the finished car looks more like a mix of two separate proposals, but both shared that fixed center steering wheel hub. Funnily enough, the X7 codename became the designation for the new generation of C5 in Citroen fan circles, what with all that fudging Mark II and Mark III naming. As is custom for an as yet unannounced car, it was completely unknown to the public. So the first hint as to what the new generation C5 would look like was at the September 2007 Frankfurt Motor Show with the convertible C5 Airscape concept. If you discount its two door open topness and its seriously brown interior, it was basically the new C5 
with little differences in relation to the final product. For some reason, the Airscape never made it into production, perhaps because parent company Peugeot didn't want an internal competitor to its ugly 407 coupe and nasty looking convertibles, the 207cc and 307cc. So 2008 saw the launch of a completely new generation of C5, and during any car's launch, marketing plays a major role in getting sales. Citroën's marketing has always been a bit hit and miss. An example of a hit was the C4 Dancing Robot, which definitely wowed viewers upon being exhibited on our TV screens in 2004. And then there was the campaign for the subject of this video, the C5. The tagline was unmistakably German, asterisk made in France. And the campaign showed a bunch of videos of the car being driven and loved by Germans, and the actors pretending they were fooled into believing it was a German car. Now, upon viewing this, Citroën fans weren't too happy, since Citroën is by far the most French of the French car brands. You see, the French don't care what anyone else thinks and will do things their own way and Citroëns were the automotive embodiment of this attitude. And that was why Citroën has always had a reputation for innovation, quirkiness, being a bit crazy, and always doing its own thing, which in turn led the brand to garner a ferociously loyal following. As for all the non-Citroën people, hearing the C5 is German also left them scratching their heads. German cars in this class are all about the badge on the bonnet, sporty suspension and hard cornering, and conservative risk-free styling. If you want to make a car seem German, maybe don't give it a steering wheel with a fixed central hub and don't give the saloon a concave rear window. But to be fair to Citroën, it's easy to understand why they went down this route. In 2005, Citroën launched the C6, and it was French as croissants, baguettes, and setting cars on fire when you're annoyed about something. It was also a gigantic middle finger aimed straight at the German executive car norm. Exterior styling was outlandish with bold, curvaceous lines. As Fifth Gear's Tom Ford put it, instead of a normal saloon, which is three boxes, it was one giant swoosh. Its interior was minimalist yet space age, even though its center console was lifted directly from a post facelift first gen C5, but let's gloss over that. And it included gadgets that were unseen in most mainstream cars, such as a lane departure warning system, a world first safety feature consisting of the bonnet popping up if it hits a pedestrian, and a heads up display that projected speed and sat nav information directly onto the windscreen. In the best Citroën tradition, it was focused on comfort without compromising the handling, thanks to hydropneumatic suspension, but alas, this really didn't fit the zeitgeist of the mid-2000s, where all cars had to be sporty and had to do well on a test track, and German cars were the standard every other car maker was supposed to aspire to. And then when the C6 found its way into the hands of motoring journalists, it was initially lauded overall for its comfort and gadgetry, praise that was immediately counterbalanced with how it was French, and how all its electronics would go haywire within a month of buying the car. And most of all, the talk of depreciation, right from the moment the car was shown to the world. It just simply ended up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. If motoring journalists said the car was going to depreciate, then depreciate it will. This attitude was summed up in the way that James May of Top Gear introduced a C6. He heaped praise on the car and ended the segment with the words, watch it flop, and flop it did. These negative remarks proved fatal to the car, and in its run it only sold around 24,000 units. And there's no way to spin this as anything other than a complete and dismal failure. Even the C6's predecessor, the Citroen XM, sold 330,000 units, and that was considered a major disappointment. So when it came time to launch the new C5 in 2008, Citroen thought, if you can't beat them, join them. So that's why this new version was touted as Teutonic rather than Gallic. Just as the first generation, this C5 sported Citroen's trademark hydropneumatic suspension, though unlike the first generation, there would be entry-level trims with a standard coil spring suspension setup. Since the DS and up until the Xantia, the hydropneumatic system took care of the brakes, power steering and suspension, but Citroen gradually limited the system to the suspension only. Much to the dismay of Citroen enthusiasts the world over, this generation of the C5 
would be the last Citroën to use the brand's famous technology, which had been present on its big cars in one incarnation or another since 1955. The body style looked like a three-box saloon, unlike any Citroën saloon since the ME6. Like the C6 before it, this C5 has a concave rear window to give better access to the boot. Shortly after the saloon's release, it was joined by a very smart-looking Tourer version, which is a fancy way of saying estate, or station wagon, depending on what side of the pond you're on. As mentioned at the very beginning, the C5 X7 was launched just in time for the 2008 recession, which certainly didn't help sales. Citroën C5 X7 sales peaked in 2009, with 81,000 units sold, and numbers dwindled from then on. It was subjected to some aesthetic refreshes in 2011 and 2012, giving it fancy LED DRLs and some extra chrome, as well as some other minor styling modifications. In 2014, Citroën tried to infuse some new life into the model by introducing the Cross Tourer, an outdoorsy version of the regular estate, an attempt to tap into the growing fad of SUVs, crossovers and other go-anywhere looking cars. Though similar in look to offerings like the Audi all-road estates, nothing could cover up the fact that it was just a tarted up Tourer with raised ride height, some plastic cladding and a glaring lack of off-road capability. If you've made it this far, you're probably wondering why I haven't mentioned one of the most important aspects of this and any car, the engines. And the answer is because it's a bit complicated, but I'll sum it up as best I can. Initially, the engines on this version of the C5 were carried over from the original first generation C5, sharing some with its larger sibling, the C6. But every year saw new engines introduced and others removed from the range, so it's fiendishly complicated. Broadly speaking, petrol engines were never really championed. What with this being from a car that's from France and France loving its diesel like it loves cheese and going on strike. By 2011, any petrol option was a 1.6 litre unit, and by 2015, petrol powered C5s were phased out altogether. In some countries, the C5 X7 was only ever available with diesel engines. Among these, you could choose a frugal but slightly underpowered 110 horsepower 1.6 HDI turbo diesel, all the way up to a 2.7 litre V6, which was replaced in 2009 with a 3 litre V6 with 240 horses galloping out of its front wheels. Towards the end of its run, the C5 was gradually being withdrawn from markets around the world, with the exception of China. There, it was heavily restyled in 2017, with the front looking like a mutant version of a C5 smooshed up with a C4 cactus, though in truth, the inspiration behind it was a Chinese Citroën C6, which has nothing to do with the European 2005 C6, but is in fact an extended wheelbase Peugeot 508 under the skin. Confused? Me too. By 2017, it ended production with around 390,000 units shifted, as far as I can tell, and Citroën left the large saloon slash estate segment. The current C5s are an Aircross, a fat SUV, which is the only kind of car that anyone seems to want these days, and the C5X, an estate slash saloon slash SUV. We'll see what it's like when it's reviewed. Let's not make hasty judgments. But to end this video, let's dwell a little on the legacy of the C5 X7. It seems to have left little impact on Citroën fans, perhaps due to its marketed Germanness or its lack of conspicuous Citroën innovation. There are few owners clubs, few fan pages and little cult following to speak of, and it just doesn't ignite passions like famous Citroëns, like the DS or the 2CV, or even less famous Citroëns with cult followings, for example the AX and BX. But many a vehicle has been reviled in its day only to be embraced later on, and this car may very well be on the way to becoming one of them. Believe it or not, it's one of the best built Citroëns ever made, and it was underappreciated from the very start, simply because it wasn't from an overhyped brand that can launch any car it likes and it will sell well. It wasn't helped by the way it was initially marketed, and was released just as the world was entering a massive recession. So in conclusion, this car wasn't bad at all, it was just a bit unlucky. So if you've made it this far, thanks very much for watching, and next time I'll be discussing the Citroen C5 X7's looks and interior. I bid you farewell.